Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator we're going to get started um, today is the 27th of september 2020 um well some people say we can't wait for 2020 to be over <laughs> because it comes with different surprises but we are still trying to make best of the situation um, you know, back in May, we started this webinar series, and um, and um, thankfully, we have been blessed to receive uh, uh, many uh, speakers who have offered to uh, uh, give us their time, talents, and, and and all the things they have learned over the years in, in form of a webinar. And and today, we do have uh, uh, Dr. Brian Goodacre in the house. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. It's good, good to have you on our dental webinar series today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. So well, I'm just going to get started. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, exactly 3 p.m. in Nigeria, 5 p.m. in Ethiopia, <laughs> and uh, 7 a.m. on the West Coast. Uh, <laughs> we, we do have uh, Dr. Brian Goodacre in the house. He did receive his dental degree from uh, Loma Linda University uh, in 2013. Uh, thereafter, he completed a four and a half year combined program in prosthodontics and implant dentistry, uh, uh, same at the Loma Linda University School of Dentistry in 2017, where he earned an MSD degree. He's currently an assistant professor at the School of Dentistry, and uh, it is our pleasure to welcome you to a dental webinar series. Thank you very much. Uh, please go ahead and uh, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Is that coming through clearly for everybody? Yes. yes. Okay. Perfect. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you guys, and I hope you guys are all staying safe and doing well wherever you are around the world. Um, today, I'm going to talk about digital planning and implant dentistry, and it's a topic that I really enjoy. It's It kind of combines... Um, a lot of analog things that we've learned over the many years um, that I've learned from many other people and um, that we can apply now with the, the aid of all the amazing technology that we get to work with. So today what we're going to do is go through some very basic principles really and then show you how we use them in a clinical um, environment. And a lot of this for a lot of you may be review. Some of this may be new, but I like to make sure we cover everything so everyone's kind of on the same page as we go through. So today what we'll focus on are a few topics regarding cone beam CTs. So we know some information and what we can do to maybe get the best scan possible for implant planning. We'll talk about how we can digitize patient's teeth so that we can use them in the computer. We'll talk a little bit about some planning software and um, what's available to us. And then we'll, we'll focus a little bit on 3D printing so we can talk about some different types of printers and some benefits, of course, that that can um, allow us to do some really cool things. And then the last part, we'll be showing you some guided surgery and show you how we can take all of this information, put it together and really do a, a nice present, uh, you know, uh, create something that can help uh, achieve the most accurate uh, kind of execution of an of a implant placement. So when we start with uh, cone beam CTs, um, you know, it stands for cone beam computed tomography. Um, really the, the um, importance of a cone beam CT is that a lot of times, you know, we'll do diagnosis based on radiographs and, and again, two dimensional radiographs and even maybe a panoramic radiograph we can look at and say, oh, that looks like we got a lot of bone there. Everything looks really nice. But then when you actually take a cone beam and look at this in three dimensions, all of a sudden, what you thought was a lot of bone may not be as much as you, you really had. And that could really be a problem on the day of surgery if you're trying to put an implant in. And you, you know, imagine that I'd like to put my implant somewhere in this position, let's say. And all of a sudden, you have a significant portion of that implant 
um, that would be exposed and not contained within bone. So cone beams really are very beneficial in the planning so that when you get into surgery, it's more predictable. You don't run into as many surprises. There's a lot of different machines that are available that can capture any range of um, sizes of a patient's uh, maxilla, mandible, or the entire skull. And it's important to remember when you're doing surgical guides, you need to capture at least that entire arch that you're working in. So if you're do placing an implant in the maxilla, you need to capture the entire maxilla. Just doing a little quadrant scan sometimes could get you by maybe, but it does bring you to some chances of getting more inaccuracies when you superimpose uh, the patient's teeth onto your scan. And um, that's something just to keep in mind. There's ways you can try and do that. And I know people that can, and it, it can work, but I think it does open you up to some more potential errors. So we'll talk a little bit more about um, how you do that in a little bit. Um, all comb beam machines will um, give you a proprietary viewer that comes. So once you scan the patient, you can open it up on your computer and look at it. The, um, you know, that allows you to do you know, specific planning, make measurements. Some of them even let you put an implant in. Uh, but the issue with that is you know, a patient may bring you a scan that they had taken somewhere else and all of a sudden you're having to learn a new program and so that can be tricky because you may not be able to get the full benefit of that program if you're not comfortable with it um, and some of those programs have more limited functionality so really using a comb beam machine with the proprietary for, um, software that it comes with sometimes can work out for your favor but a lot of times I find it's, it's kind of a, a nuisance so what you want to do is make sure that when you get a comb beam scan, you always get it in what's called a DICOM format. And that's really just a universal format that you can take and really, you know, get used to one program and bring any scan that a patient has into that program so that you can always use the same one. Because you can really get to know and learn that program, get comfortable with it, and then use it to its full extent uh, rather than have to each time you look at a scan have to learn a new program. So I think that's something that's very important. Um, a lot of times they'll either be with multiple uh, files like you can see on the side or they can be a single file, um, but most of the time I find that I get them as a multi-file, uh, which, which works out well when you're in all the different programs. So. Um, but you'll see it's this .dcm is kind of that, that uh, denotation of the, of the file. And so that's just kind of a key important part to try and make sure that when you do get a comb beam scan, you always have the DICOM. And all those scanners can give you that file. It's just whether or not the patient or if you don't request it, sometimes you won't get that specific one. So that's kind of the, the key with that. Now, to get the most out of your scan, there's a couple tricks that I use that I think really um, give you the highest quality scan that you can. And one of the things we have to try and figure out how to overcome are things like scatter. Um, if patients have existing restorations that have metal in them, you're always going to get some scatter associated with that. And so here you can see an example of a patient that has a significant amount of scatter. Um, sometimes if you look in the posterior, kind of in the premolar and molar areas, you really could not make out any any idea of where a cuff's tip is or anything to help you when we go later on and align an intraoral scan. So, you know, that's something that that we really know we cannot truly get rid of just because of the physics behind it. And the problem is when we want to take a scan like you see on the right and somehow merge that with the scan of the bone, it's hard to do when you have that much scatter. So while we can't get rid of it, what we can do is have things where we actually have the patients separate their teeth. So commonly I'll have a patient bite on cotton rolls or something to just separate the teeth. So while we can't get rid of the scatter, you can still see the cuss tips. And so that helps us get over that part. The other part that you can find uh, some benefit to is if we look at a cross-sectional view of a central incisor, you can see how in the cone beam, we can really make out hard tissue decently. We can see the bone, the buccal bone to some extent, we can see the tooth. But if we also go ahead and separate the lip with uh, cotton rolls, then you get this contrast between even the soft tissue and um, the, the lip. And so now you can actually even make out some soft tissue uh, landmarks as well. So I find that to be quite beneficial. Now, patients look a little funny while they're having a comb beam uh, scan taken, but you can kind of see I have them separate the teeth with cotton rolls. 
and then I'll even separate the cheek with um, with cotton rolls as well. Now, there's other ideas where you can use retractors, or you can even have the patients close their lips and and kind of blow air to separate the lips. But again, those are things that can be kind of tricky while you're having them hold still and have a cone beam scan taken. So I find cotton rolls are abundant most places. So it's not something that's hard to, to use. Um, so I find that gives us the best scan. If the patient's edentulous, it's a little different. But again, what we want to start with is a patient's denture that's adequate, that has the aesthetics and vertical dimension and everything that we really want to know already predetermined. So we're not having to make guesses on that. So if a patient has a denture that's exactly how you want it, um, what you want to do at that point is you can take their, their denture. We use these... Um, these markers that are commonly used in the medical field. Um, they're just little kind of metal BBs that are um, have an adhesive backing. And we'll go ahead and apply that to the denture. I commonly will place six of them. You can get away with less than that, but I tend to do six just to have the verification that everything's aligned properly. So I'll place that on the patient's denture We'll go ahead and place that in the cone beam machine. We elevate it off of a little platform that's designed for this. Um, and then we can go ahead and take a cone beam scan. And you can see the scan as it's being taken shows us exactly where those radiopaque markers are. So we have those six markers. Then I'll go ahead and place the denture in the patient's mouth, have him close down, stay closed, and again, take a scan of the patient. And so now you can see those same markers are evident in the cone beam scan. And this will allow us to now superimpose the two together. So based on those six markers, you can see there's the scan of the bone. And here's the cone beam scan of the denture. And so what the computers will do is they'll go ahead and use those markers to align everything together, which will then give us a nice, very accurate representation of, hey, here's where the teeth are going to be. How do we plan our implants so that they can be in the proper position? So here you can see what that would look like where you can see the outline of the denture, you can see the implant that's placed, and then we can even go through and make measurements and place the implant at the proper depth so that we can have adequate room for whichever type of restoration we're doing. So that's how we then handle an edentulist patient. But it's very key that you always start with an excellent denture that fits well and that is exactly where, everything, where, the teeth, where you want the teeth to be so that you're making accurate plans. And so if you have a denture that's not fitting well, I suggest you reline that in some form so that you have an accurate record of how that fits. Because if you're going to make a guide, that fit of your guide will be 100% determined by how well this initial denture fits as well. So that kind of gives you a little bit on some tips and tricks that we do with cone beams. Now what we want to do is that information is all about how do we digitize hard tissue? Well, now um, of the bone and, and teeth, but now how do we get a more accurate representation of let's say the soft tissue as well as the occlusal surfaces and contours of the teeth? And so in that sense, we have to digitize the patient's teeth. And we just talked about you digitize the bone with a cone beam CT machine and you get this DICOM format that you want to use. When it comes to the teeth, you have a few more options available to you. So you can use a cone beam machine, an intraoral scanner, or a lab scanner. We'll go through some specifics of how you can do that. And the key for all of these options is at the end of everything, you want to make sure you can get a, what's called an STL file, which is, again, like a DICOM. It's a universal format that all programs accept so that you can, again, get used to using one program and then master that program and use it as much as you, um, you know, to its full extent using these types of universal formats. So you're not stuck with just one proprietary software. Um, so let's go through a little bit about that. So when it comes to an STL file, there's many definitions out there. So this is just one example of what they call it. Um, but the key to know is this STL file is made up of many triangles. So if you look at this picture and I zoom in, you can see little tiny triangles that make up the surface of this tooth. And so what really tells you the quality of whatever scanner you're using is how large are each of those triangles. If those triangles are very large, then that would mean the scanner is not quite as accurate. If those triangles are small, 
then that's a little more accurate or higher, what we call, let's say, definition of a scan. And so that's something to keep in mind when you're, you're thinking of uh, quality of different scanners. And then what we normally see on a computer screen is something where they actually wrap that surface with a specific color so that we see a tooth. Um, but behind that tooth are a lot of triangles that make up that specific shape. And so that's where you'd want this file that would have the extension at the end of a .stl, and that's just that STL file. So what I'm going to do is let's go and talk through a couple ways in which you can get this STL file. And then what we'll do is we'll compare at the end all of those to each other to see which ones maybe are better than others. And I think that's important to know the limitations of these techniques. So one example is if you happen to have a cone beam machine, but maybe you don't have an intraoral scanner, and that could be a scenario. We'll go through some other scenarios. Um, you can actually take a, a PVS impression, place it into a cone beam machine, just like we did with the denture, and you can actually take a cone beam scan of your impression. So here you can see the different views of that, and you can see where you can see the tray, and then you can see the impression material. And what can happen is you have to be careful because cone beam machines allow you to change some settings in them. And so here you can see I'm growing or shrinking the size of that impression. So you have to make sure that you don't mess with that too much. Otherwise, obviously, the teeth would get larger or smaller. So that's something you have to keep in mind. But if you have a nice accurate scan of it, then what ends up happening is you see a nice representation of this impression. Um, and then all you have to do is if you delete the outer surface, there's a, a, a normal, what we'd call a, a cast or model underneath that's representing the patient's teeth. So that's one possible way in which you could digitize a patient's teeth. We'll go ahead and compare them in a little bit so you can really see the difference. But um, there are some machines out there that will, cone beam machines that will kind of automatically do some of these steps for you. So that's one way in which you can digitize a uh, patient's teeth. If you have a stone cast, you can also take a cone beam scan of that um, and do, again, this is a different program, but similar, uh, you do the same thing where you, you create a model of that that's cast, and now you have a digital file of the patient's teeth. So there's just another example of how you could digitize a patient's teeth. Um, there's different programs that allow you to do this where you can take what a DICOM uh, from a cone beam machine and create an STL file. You know, some of them are good, great programs that you have to pay for. For example, here, uh, we also have some programs that are free. So there's ones like Invisalius, um, which have been, that were made many years ago, but they work quite well. And then you can also use some other programs that are free to allow you to manipulate and modify these models. So, um, you know, the downside when commonly when you have anything that's free, um, you know, sometimes it takes a little more learning curve. But the beauty of it is a lot of these programs have some great educational tutorials on how to use them. So there's a lot of great information out there about how to do that. So it, it's, a, it's a nice way to take a DICOM from a cone beam scan and get an STL file of it. Um, so that's something that's, that can be quite beneficial. We always have the option of scanning an impression. So if you take a lab scanner, you can scan um, an impression. So here you can see an example where I scan the impression. And again, you can get a nice, um, digital, you know, copy or digital uh, representation of the patient's teeth. However, you have to remember an, a scanner always has to have direct sight to see that. So sometimes you can have different positions of teeth that the scanner cannot acquire everything because it cannot physically get the light from the scanner to get all the way through. So if you have, <clears throat> you know, a uh, reclined tooth, sometimes the, uh, the light cannot get in there. You wouldn't be able to capture the maxillary anterior teeth exactly how you'd want. So there are limitations to scanning impressions. Um, you can also scan a cast um, as well. So again, put it in a, in, a, in a lab scanner. You can just simply scan the cast, get a nice uh, digitized uh, version of that, as well as, of course, nowadays, primarily what we use to digitize patient, patient's teeth are intraoral scanners. So this is probably the most common thing we're doing now is just intraorally scanning the patient. So with these different options, how do they really compare to each other? And if we go ahead and we look at um, the, the 
five different ways that we, we digitize this patient and we zoom in a little bit closer. So here you can see just looking at the two central incisors, you can see a significant difference in the surface texture of each of these. And so what you really want to pay attention to is the two on the bottom left of your screen, which the cone beam of a cast and an impression, while yes, it did digitize the patient's teeth, you can see the surface texture is not quite as nice as the other three options. So for me, if I'm going to be making a surgical guide, while you probably could get away with the digitization, you're using the comb beam, I primarily will use these three options because they do give me the highest quality scan. So that's where I work with, but I know you physically or technically can use the others. I just haven't really spent much time working with them because I don't get as high quality of an image. So that gives us an idea of how we can digitize the patient's teeth and soft tissue. And now what we need to do is take both the comb beam and the, the digitized patient, merge that together. And that's going to be all done in different planning software. And there's so many programs out there that it's not really feasible to go through all of them. But this is a list of some of the ones that I've used. And really, they all have a lot of great benefits that they offer. But really what I suggest, and I've been kind of talking about or alluding to, is you really want to choose one and become a master at it. It's, it's really challenging to try and learn multiple programs because after you use one for a while, you get really good at it. And then all of a sudden, if you switch to another, you have to relearn that. So um, the things you want to think about when it comes to which one you want to use, obviously a big component is always going to be the cost of the program. Um, how much does it cost to get a guide if you decide to design a guide? Is there a fee when you export that STL file of the design, which you'll see some examples a little later? How easy is it to use? Are there any annual fees? So these are some of those things that you got to consider. And there's programs on here that, you know, are amazing, but of course you have to pay for that, but they tend to be a little easier to use. And then you have other programs that are free. So for example, Blue Sky is a, is a great program. I use it quite a bit. It's free, but the learning curve sometimes is a little bit more. Um, but once you know it, it works very well. So you have to kind of make that decision as to what works best in your hands. So that kind of gives you a little background on, on the different programs. Transferring information between or into this for planning, such as where the position of teeth are, this is how we would traditionally make a template to have the patient wear when they're scanned to represent where we want the teeth. And this is a great way to do it, um, but nowadays we have ways we can do this all on the computer. So this was, you know, what I did in dental school, for example, or in actually residency um, as a planning, and it works quite well. But nowadays what we'll do is we'll go with some digitally placed teeth. But here you can see a patient wears that during the scan. And then now I have a nice representation of where the tooth is going to be and where that implant can be planned according to where it prosthetically based on the tooth. So that's how we would do the traditional, um, what we call an analog um, radiographic template. Nowadays, what we'll do is we'll actually just take our comb beam scan, we'll merge a scan of the patient's cast in this example or an intraoral scan. And then we can just digitally place teeth in the computer. So here you can see two molars that are placed. Um, and then we can change the position, look at it in multiple views to make sure that we have the exact position that we would like. And then we can actually place the implant in the computer and make sure it's prosthetically planned coming right through the occlusal surface, if that's what we're looking for, of course. Um, and we can make all of our measurements and see how much room we have. So that's really kind of the, the keys to how we do this. So I can see I have 11.9 millimeters of of space from the platform of the implant to the occlusal surface of that tooth. Um, and then we can go based on our planned imp uh, implant positions that are prosthetically driven, we can then design a surgical guide to help put the, t the implants exactly where we want. Um, and the key with a surgical guide is there's always certain dimensions of how they plan the exact position of the surgical guide. So if we take a surgical guide and look at it in a cross-sectional view, you will see there's always going to be some component that will fit over your existing teeth if it's a tooth-supported guide, and then there'll be a metal sleeve that goes into that guide. And what 
each program or, or implant company will have um, some specific measurements that everything is specifically determined so you have to pay attention to whichever implant system you're working with but for an example um, a Nobel BioCare implant is a, just as an example from the top of your metal sleeve to the implant platform is designed in the computer to be offset by nine millimeters and you'll see why how this plays in a little bit later um, but then what we'll do is they will have some form of a little metal sleeve or a key or some people call, you know, they call them all different things that is then placed in that metal sleeve. And once that's in place, you're now offset by 10 millimeters. And this is important because one, it allows you to get a little off away from where the tissue will be um, and give you some room to to uh, have the sleeve to guide that drill. But it also is important because 10 millimeters is an easy number to remember. So you're placing a 10 millimeter long implant and my offsets now 10 millimeters with that sleeve. It's easy to know I'm gonna drill 20 millimeters to get to the right depth. So it's also easy for uh, dentists and myself included who maybe mass not our prime uh, focus. So it can be kind of a, a nice tool. And then based on that, you can drill and place your implant and they'll have specific surgical drills for the guides that make sure you get to the right depth. So it can be a nice, a nice way to get a predictably placed implant. So let's go through one example of that. The one, the example you just saw where we have a patient, we're gonna be placing two posterior molars. Um, implants and so here you can see a surgical guide um, if there's enough keratinized mucosa um, I will sometimes use tissue punches otherwise I do other techniques where you'll roll the tissue underneath so you can again maintain as much keratinized mucosa so again you have to be careful and when you're using this make sure you have adequate keratinized mucosa but I'll use a tissue punch and I can actually just create two little tissue punches where those implants will be I can then remove the tissue and then I'm ready to go ahead and expose I have the bone underneath and then simply go ahead and place the implant. So here you can see the key that's placed in the surgical guide and then the drill. Now something with guided surgery, always have to be careful that you have enough room because these drills, as you can see, are quite long. So you have to make sure the patient can open wide enough and you sometimes can run into problems in the posterior where you may not have as much vertical space for you to get all of this component because you have to get the surgical handpiece, the drill, the key and then the surgical guide all of that in and that can sometimes be be a challenge um, so here you can see the initial drill i always take a radiograph to verify at least the spacing of it because i want to make sure before i enlarge that osteotomy that i have the implants exactly where i would like them so i can take my radiograph make sure i'm not getting close to the adjacent teeth and make sure everything's looking good. Then you're going to simply go ahead and enlarge the osteotomy until you have the final drill. And there you can see the final um, osteotomy that's been created. And then we place the implant. And you can place the implant through the surgical guide or sometime in this example, I freehanded the final placement because at least I had the proper um, mesial distal orientation, which I find is the most important because the rest of it, since I have teeth on either side, um, you can, again, you already have the osteotomy to guide you. Um, and then you can kind of parallel the rest of it yourself, but again, to each their own. Um, and what's important with this type of surgery is this is a patient that had a significant amount of bone. So this is one where you could almost place two implants next to each other facial lingually or buccal lingually. Um, whereas if I'm trying to thread a needle where I have very minimal amount of bone, I'm going to raise the flap, look at how much bone I have and make sure that I'm not uh, perforating anywhere. This one had so much bone, I didn't need to worry about it. So that's something else you want to keep in mind. So here you can see the implants are in their final position. And then I place my healing abutments. <clears throat> and then you can see the final um, radiograph um, with the implants placed. So that is a nice predictable way. And I find, you know, if it's a single tooth that I'm working with, then I don't always need a surgical guide. But when it's multiple teeth in an edentulous area, I find it's beneficial to have a guide to at least, if nothing else, mark the mesial distal position. And then the rest you could freehand. So there's many options where you can do just a pilot guide 
or you can go the fully guided. And that's kind of a personal decision. Um, but I find, especially when it's two teeth or, or let's say an entire edentulous, maybe quadrant um, that you're working with, it's nice to be able to have something to get the right positions because it's very difficult when you don't have other teeth to know exactly where to put that implant. So with that kind of giving you a background of at least the, the surgical guide part, let's talk a little bit about 3D printing. Um, this is a, a, an awesome topic. It's a lot of fun to, to work with, but there's a lot of types of printers available and knowing which one to choose can be challenging. So this is one type of printer that's called uh, an FDM and you, it's kind of like a hot glue gun that lays down one layer at a time. Um, until it builds a three-dimensional object. And so that can be a, a nice way. This was kind of one of the first printers that I, I got to work with. Um, and it, it can work nicely. You can see an example where we were printing a maxillary bone model. Um, and and it, it does work quite well. It does have some limitations, um, but they tend to be ones that are the least expensive, so they can be used for bone models. I don't use these for making surgical guides directly because the, the accuracy I get with specific ones I've worked with are not as, as good as some of the other technology that we have, but they, they can be relatively inexpensive. Another type is called stereolithography, which is where it uses a laser that's focused with a lens and it bounces off of a mirror. And then anywhere that that laser touches this tank of resin, it will polymerize it. And then that laser just moves around until it covers the entire cross-sectional shape of that image and then slowly builds this three-dimensional object. So here you can see <clears throat> kind of a video from Form Labs where they show you how the laser then moves around polymerizing the, the resin until it builds a three-dimensional object. And so that's a, that's a nice one that, again, is still somewhat expensive, but not too bad. But it allows you to do a lot of great um, surgical guides and other types of models that you might use. And similar to this type of printer is one that's called a digital light processing or DLP, which is, you know, similar to maybe projectors if, you've, if you have worked with different types of video projectors. And what they do is they use that projector to flash an image that wherever the light of that image contacts this tank of resin, it will polymerize it. As opposed to a laser, for each layer that you build this three-dimensional object, the laser has to move all the way around to polymerize the resin. This will polymerize that entire layer at one time. So therefore, it tends to be a lot faster of a way to print. And here you can see an example where the, it moves off. You can see a light will flash that will polymerize an entire layer. Then the build platform will move slightly away. It'll come back flashlight cure the next layer and in between each one what it's doing is it's trying to let some resin in between some oxygen and different things to allow um, the resin to be polymerized to each layer and so that slowly builds this three-dimensional object um, and again these can be ranging all kinds of, of prices as well um, some other technology that's out there that's really impressive is something called polyjet which lays down a powder that then is polymerized. And this allows them to do different colors. So you can see some examples where they can lay down a three-dimensional object and build things that look really awesome. You know, like here's a bicycle helmet with different colors. And so you can imagine that type of technology maybe being applied to printing a crown with multiple shades built into it. So you could build a dentin shade and then enamel on top of it, or let's say build, print a denture with pink and white colors. So you can imagine the, the future applications, but again, it comes down to having those materials available that are FDA approved or allowed to be used in the mouth. So those are some of the things we still have to wait. These printers are more expensive, um, but they offer us some uh, potential benefits. The, the last type of printer I want to talk about, which is a, it's a fascinating printer. It's a carbon uh, is the company that makes it and it's called this clip technology. But what's interesting is it has a oxygen permeable membrane in the tank. So it actually can inject oxygen in between. So it doesn't have to in between each layer lift up and come back down. And so it's really kind of fascinating to just watch this print. So see how it just kind of comes out of the resin. Now this is sped up significantly but to see it's impressive. And so this is a very quick and fast printer 
um, that as the companies describe, you can go and take something that would take you six and a half minutes um, with this technology would take you either three hours or even they say 11 and a half hours um, with some other technology. So it's quite impressive what it can do. The, the downside to it is of course with all this great technologies, it's expensive. And so you can see it tends to, it's $150,000 um, and it's set up kind of as a lease where you have to pay, I think it's 50,000 each year for a three year lease. And then at the end of that, if there's new technology, then you can sign up again. So it, it ends up being something that's quite expensive and you'd have to do a significant amount of printing to offset that cost. So it's not something you're gonna have as a hobby printer in your, in your office or in your home just for fun, but it's an amazing, amazing technology and it's, it's a great, great printer. So some things to think about with printers is obviously the price, the different materials that are available are a significant thing to keep in mind. Uh, you want a printer that can let you do various things. So you don't want one that only does one material. Um, you also want you know, an, an accurate printer. So for the different types, like if you're having one that has the laser, well, what's the size or diameter of that laser beam? That plays a big role in your, your accuracy. And then if it has a projector, it's, well, what's the level of resolution or um, pixel size with the projector? So some things to, to think in mind. And then what's the software that runs it? I find that to be very important because you have to take whatever file you're printing, put it into the software, and then let it sp choose and determine how to print it. And so that becomes something that's very important. And some printers look very... Um, hobby level where they're made maybe in your garage, I would suggest staying away from them because you almost need to, for some of them, have to have a software engineering software background to make them work. And you can see some of them require some assembly yourself. Or in this example, you have to put the, the printer together and actually put the projector inside this box. And those are ones I'd suggest staying away from because um, there's a lot of user error that you could maybe make a mistake and then it wouldn't print and then you'd be kind of frustrated with it. So you want something that comes already ready to print that you know will be predictable each time you print it. So I hope that kind of gave you some background on printers. Um, and then the last part is going to now we're going to kind of take all of these four things that we've talked about and now put it together into some guided surgery. And so what I wanted to focus on is show you one example of an immediate implant and how we utilize this to give us kind of all the information we want to restore an anterior tooth with an immediate provisional. So here you can see an example of a patient. She fractured um, her lateral incisor um, and we're going to restore that with an implant. There's different ways in which we can, you know, restore, provisionalize this tooth. And so a couple different options to keep in mind is you have some types of uh, um, shells that you can create. So this is one example where we have a shell that's um, hollowed it out on the inside that when we place the implant, we can pick up its location on the implant the day of surgery. And that gives us a lot of freedom. And so I, you know, this is kind of what I call a freehand emergence profile, because once you pick up the position of this provisional, you have to now develop that emergence from where the implant is to where the the crown starts or where you emerge out of the tissue. And so that's kind of a technique sensitive part where you want to get specific contours. <clears throat> There's other ways where when we do guided surgery, we can also do things where we actually have a guided emergence profile. And that's where in the computer, we can predetermine the shape of that emergence profile that we want to use. So I'm going to go through and show you the example of a guided emergence profile just to show you the benefits of it, but also some concerns and drawbacks that can be, uh, uh, you know, can occur when you use that. So I want you to see that because a lot of times the shell is a great way to go. It gives you more freedom to accommodate for any changes in where the implant ends up. But this can be a very nice way as well. So let's go through that kind of workflow just to give you a different perspective. So on the first appointment, the patient comes in, we're gonna go through the steps like we talked about, take a cone beam CT scan, we're gonna intraorally scan the patient, and then we're gonna select a shade, get everything ready so that we know what color uh, we can, and uh, shade and um, that we're gonna make that provisional. Then we'll go through and do a pre-surgical planning. On the computer, we'll plan the implant position, we'll fabricate and or design and fabricate a surgical guide, and then we'll make a provisional as well. And then the day of surgery, you're gonna go ahead, extract the tooth, 
place an implant and provisionalize that implant. So for the example we're gonna go through, I'm gonna use a program called, um, it's, it's in three shape and it's there, it's kind of the program that allows you to do the planning and design a surgical guide um, all within three shapes implant studio. So here you can see, this is what their menu looks like. And this is the first place where when you start the case, you're telling the computer what I'm gonna do. So here I'm gonna select the tooth, I'm going to tell it I wanna place a virtual crown and design and place an implant and a, design a surgical guide. I've already scanned the patient, so now I'm gonna bring in that DICOM scan from the cone beam, and then that will bring in the patient's hard tissue. Now I can virtually place a tooth uh, where I want it. So here I'm just gonna set the tooth close to where I want it, and I'll position it, um, you know, get it in the ballpark. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy the contralateral tooth. So now it's gonna copy the other lateral incisor. And now all I have to do is just kind of reposition that. And so now we have a nice replica if we wanna use that. If not, we can put our own tooth in and change the shape. So there's the final position that I'd like that lateral incisor to be. I can check its proximity to the opposing arch, and now we align the scan together. And so if we look in the bottom fit picture, we're just making sure that the software aligned the scan of the teeth with the cone beam properly, which it did, and then I have to confirm it. Uh, that's an important step to do. Then I can go ahead and add the implant um, and place that in the cone beam data and now position it and measure and make sure I have the proper depth so I can have the right emergence profile. So you can see I'm placing it about three, three and a half millimeters below the gingival margin, the planned gingival margin, and I'm making sure I have enough of the implant and bone so I'll get enough stability on the day of surgery. Then based on that position, we can design a surgical guide. So here I'm just outlining the shape of it and there's the final surgical guide that's been designed. Uh, and you can see where that sleeve is that has the offset of nine millimeters to the platform of the implant. And then I can put windows in to make sure that when I put the surgical guide in the patient's mouth, I can verify that it is completely seated. Because you can imagine if during the printing process, anything gets distorted, that surgical guide may not fit completely. And of course, then the implant would not end up in the right position. So now what we'll do is we'll take that surgical guide. In this example, I used an SLA type of printer. So we can put the surgical guide in the software. It will generate the supports and you orient it properly. And then I simply will say print. So it sends it to the printer and um, it'll start 3D, 3D printing that specific surgical guide. So here's the printer itself. Once we're done printing, you can see in that build platform, it took this specific printer about two and a half hour, two hours, 21 minutes to print the surgical guide. You can see what that guide looks like when it's um, finished. It's kind of this uh, yellow green color. You have to take that surgical guide out and then soak it in some isopropyl alcohol. Um, I use an ultrasonic cleaner uh, to help that process, uh, but many different ways to do this. Um, and then once you've cleaned the surface, now you have to actually polymerize it so that it becomes actually uh, stronger uh, and ready for use in the patient's mouth. So here, here's a light box that you put that in and it'll expose the, the print to a specific wavelength of light um, as well as the temperature. And once it's finished polymerizing, you'll see it'll actually change color and be a kind of this orange color. And then at that point, you can go ahead and remove the supports. Then you can actually go ahead and you can see I place the metal sleeve into the surgical guide. I'll sometimes nowadays would do that before I polymerize it as well. Um, and then it's ready to be autoclaved and ready to be used on the day of surgery. So while that's being done, you have all of your components for the surgery ready. Now what we can do is based on that planned implant position, we can actually now design the provisional. And so this is where you could either do a shell or the final uh, full contour emergence profile provisional. So sorry, let me go back and start this video for you. So here you can see there's the my planned tooth shape. And then based on the implant that we have with our surgical guide, there's the position of that implant. Then we can have a titanium base that we place on that as our interface. I can fine tune the contours of the provisional. 
and really shape and smooth and do whatever I would like until I have the right contours for the coronal part of the tooth. Then based on that implant position, I can now work on the emergence profile um, subgingivally. Um, and so here you can see I can adjust the contours so it follows um, uh, the proper emergence profiles. And you can see how you can change the, the emergence until you're happy with it. And then there's the metal sleeve um, that this will be fitting on. And we can even do things where we can actually add the screw access hole for the day of surgery. So we know that's going to come out through the incisal edge. And we can also make, make a specific positioning jig to make sure that we get that tooth in the exact position we want based on our planning. So those are kind of those components that we, we end up using to design a provisional. So there's this provisional, the positioning jig, and then that will all fit um, in the patient's mouth on a titanium base. So this information is then sent to, uh, in this example, we milled it. Um, and so we, on our, on our mill, we go ahead, you could print in some scenarios as well. Um, we milled out the provisional and then we actually layered the facial surface um, so that it aesthetically matched closer to the patient because the patient's uh, chroma of their teeth or the color was a lot um, kind of a little bit more unique to that patient. So we customized it as well. You can see that the titanium base has some little wings on it. And that's the part that when you go to place an implant, it's hard to control one, the depth of that implant exactly, but also the rotation of that implant so that that, that little um, little notch would perfectly align with the provisional. So what we do is we go in and we actually will remove that little um, notch on the titanium base so we don't have to worry about that. But you can see there's the positioning jig, which we added a little more to help position it and hold it in place. And then we have our titanium base that's on that, that we've removed those little sleeves. So that actually titanium base can turn 360 degrees within the provisional, which is perfectly fine for what we're doing right now. So here you can see the day of surgery, patient comes in, we remove the tooth. You can see again, the, the, the tooth removed, then we can go ahead and place our um, surgical guide in the patient's mouth. You can see again with those windows, I can verify that it's completely seated. If it's not completely seated, I need to figure out why that is. Um, and then we can use the surgical guide to place the implant. And then now you can see the titanium base sticking through the tissue. Then using this positioning jig, I can place that provisional exactly where I want it. And what I do is I, I will actually, you know, block out the access hole and I'll actually cement it on with a resin cement. And again, that's something you have to be careful with, but the idea is no matter what, I'm gonna be removing this so I can remove anything that gets expressed out um, that could be a problem. So again, I'm not putting a lot, but just enough to pick up the position. And then here you can see where I'll fill in any difference that I have. And what's important to see is I filled that with composite, but what's important to look at is you can see the difference between my platform and where the planned implant um, uh, of the provisional was. And so this is telling you that in the surgical guide process, my implant was off about a millimeter, let's say, in the vertical dimension. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the errors that surgical guides give you in a second. But you can see exactly how, again, not a big problem. What would be a, a more significant error is if you have an angular problem. So this works out well, but it's good to know that that's one of the limitations with this type of a provisional is if you don't have the implant in the exact position, you know, again, vertically, you're probably okay as long as it's not significant, but uh, angular could be a bigger problem. And that's where you might want to think of using the shell instead of this emergence profile. But I wanted to show you this example so you can understand some nice concepts you can use, but some limitations as we always have with different techniques. So here you can see the provisional in the patient's mouth. The beauty of this way of doing it is the, con the provisionalization part is very quick. It doesn't take very long. Um, and then here you can see after the four months of healing, um, and then at this point, we're ready to go ahead and um, fabricate the final crown. So we're going to go ahead and scan the patient's mandible again. We'll scan their maxilla. We'll go ahead and scan how the teeth fit together. And then we'll come back and scan the specific information about that implant. So here you can see uh, the scan of the maxilla and the mandible, which we just intraorally scanned. And I scanned it with the provisional in the patient's mouth. 
Then I'm gonna go ahead and scan the emergence profile. So capture the contours of that tissue that my provisional has developed. And then go ahead and um, I'll show you the, the emergence profile. So here you can see I deleted just that area and then I can scan submucosally and actually see, you can see how far below the tissue you can actually capture. And what's interesting to see is here you can see there's the, the submucosal tissue, there's the implant. So I was actually able to scan inside of the implant and this allows us to now match and mimic exactly what that emergence profile that we determined with the provisional was. So we're not having to make a significant amount of change. So here you can see that's the emergence profile that my provisional um, was able to achieve. And so now I can match that when I do my final crown design. So the last step now is we have to scan the implant in its final position so we know exactly where it's located. So we go ahead and place a scan body that's located on the implant and then I go ahead and will capture all of the um, as much information as possible of that scan body so that we can use that for the computer to tell us exactly where that implant is um, after the implant was placed. So here you can see the uh, scan body, if we remove the color, you can see it has a very unique shape so that we can position that implant properly. And then with that information, now we have everything of how the provisional looked, where the implant is, and how the teeth fit together so we can design the final crown. So here in the, in the lab version of 3Shape software, what we're gonna do is actually design the final crown. So here's the, the scan of the provisional, which we like the shape pretty close. So there's a copy of that that we can use as our template. Then we can actually go and match our emergence profile again so that it matches the contour of the patient's tissue that was developed by the provisional. And here you can see the the final provisional and uh, the final design of the crown as well as the facial cutback so that we can then have a layer it with porcelain to make it match the patient's existing teeth. We can also do an angle correction where we can move the access hole and use um, an angle correction screw to allow us to uh, have a screw access um, on the lingual surface and not have to cement the restoration, which is a huge benefit. In my opinion, I love that being able to retrieve it if I ever needed to. Um, one example I wanted to bring up just real quick for everyone is if you look in this picture, do you see how the cutback we did here did not include the proximal contact? And this was one of the earlier ones that I did a number of years ago. And nowadays what I like to do is a different patient here, but I want you to see um, when I design the, the cutback, I like to make sure that I keep the proximal contact is part of my um, monolithic part of the restoration so that I don't have to worry about the proximal contacts. Because when you hand layer this, you have to remember in a digital environment, you're not having a stone model or something, you're gonna have to use a 3D printed model. And when you print models, some of the errors you can have really have to do with proximal contacts primarily because the implant can be off a little bit. So you can see in this example, I maintain the proximal contact with the adjacent teeth. Um, and that's because what we do with this patient is we're gonna print a model for the laboratory to be able to see the contours of the teeth. But when you print a model and put an analog in there for the implant, it's been shown through a number of research projects that you get a lot of deviation primarily when it's, and the, the main difference is when you're putting that analog into the model, there's some distortion. So I don't like to use this to determine the exact proximal contact. So in the computer, it's an accurate scan before you've printed something. So I like to maintain that uh, proximal contact. So here you can see um, the cutback after this is zirconia um, um, abutment has been, or um, I guess uh, coping has been made uh, and then this will be hand layered. And so you can see the technician will layer the facial surface with some porcelain and just add multiple layers until they get the final shape and contour and build in that translucency that we want. And so here you can see the, the final crown. It has a titanium base that connects the zirconia to the uh, titanium implant and then a special screw that's used to allow us to do this angle correction. So here you can see um, the final crown with the screw. Um, so we'll go ahead and we place the crown in the patient's mouth and we can seal up the access. So I cover the screw with some Teflon uh, tape 
and then I'll place composite on top of that. And then you can see the, the final result in the patient's mouth and the final kind of close up of the, of the final restoration. So again, different uh, ways to do it, but this is a nice way to take, go from provisional all the way through to the final restoration that I think can be quite uh, beneficial. So the last thing I wanted to show you, um, again, just keeping it very simple with the surgical guides is I did wanna bring up a couple things on um, comparing surgical guides. And, and one of those things is we have these, you know, things like static surgical guides, which are what I've shown you where they, you're printed, they fit on the teeth, for example. They do involve, like we showed you, you have to print them, clean them, polymerize them, and then sterilize them. And once the guide is made, you cannot make any changes to it. But what's important to know is when you look at some of the research out there that taught, looks at, um, you know, surgical guides and things like that, they can bring up some interesting information um, such as errors that, that occur. And so this was a nice systematic review that went through and looked at the errors and surgical guides. And they said, and they found that in a horizontal direction at the entry point of your surgical guide, you, they, they found you can be up to one, 1 1.2 millimeters off. So that can be a, obviously could be a significant problem. You can have at the apex, a little bit more than a mil, you know, uh, 1.39 millimeters at the apex. There's also um, implant failure rate, thankfully, is, is quite low with surgical guides, so it's not a difference if you do it freehand versus guided. Um, but they did find other types of complications, which were quite significant, which were related to things such as, you know, fracture of the template, you know, so let's say if the guide doesn't fit well, and you're trying to force it into place, the guide could fracture. Um, you could get things like lack of uh, the, again, the stability of the guide. You can, if you wanted to make a, a change in your plan, well, obviously you can't use that guide anymore. Um, you know, if there's a, any kind of fracture in a prosthesis, they also included things like misfit and screw loosening in this complication. So, you know, there's other things that maybe aren't directly related to the surgical guide, but it's important to know that there are differences when it comes to, uh, um, you know, the exact position of the implant. And there's also some other things with angulation errors that can happen as well. So it's something that's important to remember that guided surgery is great to get you in the ballpark, but don't expect it to be, you know, perfectly accurate. It just helps you get really close. So it's something that you got to remember there are some errors associated with it. Now, because of static guides, some of the new technology that we're getting into, which is quite fascinating, are things like dynamic surgery. And that's where once you plan it on the computer, you're ready to do the surgery. You don't have to make anything in advance. Um, and so that's something that allows you to make changes during the surgery, which could be quite beneficial. So this is an example of the X-Guide, um, which is quite fascinating to use, um, where it tracks the position of the handpiece and based on your planning, it's kind of like you're just trying to uh, just kind of follow the exact uh, predetermined position. So here you can see it's telling you um, not only angle, depth, um, and everything, uh, mesial distal position. Um, so it's kind of like a GPS for your, your hand piece. So it kind of guides you exactly where you're going. So you'll see an example here where it's telling you even the depth. So when you get to the full depth, it will alert you that you're at that specific depth. So these are some of the things that are quite fascinating. Um, and even taking it to the next level, there's even some um, I, I've worked with the previous one or at least had to play with it, but this is a new one where they actually have a robot arm, which I have not personally been in, uh, but used uh, necessarily, but you plan the implant position and what it does is this robotic arm will kind of restrict you to only um, place that implant close to your predetermined position. So here's where, again, virtually you've placed an implant in the bone um, and then based on where you place it, <clears throat> the uh, robot arm will only give you a narrow kind of window of how much variation you can have. So it still lets you do some of it, but it restricts you so you can't place the implant too far off of um, where your planning was. So here you can see an example, this will come into the mouth and then it will kind of, if you actually try and deviate past that, it will actually prevent you from doing that. So you can see here based on that, kind of pre-planned position. You can see once he gets it in there, 
now if he pulls on it in either direction, it won't let him move it. So he it kind of, again, guides you. So that's some of the stuff that you can see, obviously, in the future will come in. But of course, the limitations with that technology would, of course, be the cost of it. So that's why we have to keep that in mind that, um, you know, not always the most practical in that sense, but it's awesome to see the technology available to us. So I hope with that, it kind of gave you a brief kind of quick introduction into the different technology that we use and then how we can use that for things like, um, you know, just placing implants or even going the next step in provisionalizing and shows you how we can really use this to give us nice, accurate results. But we have to always remember that, you know, whatever quality you get at the end is really determined based on the quality of the different records that you put into the computer. Because unfortunately, computers aren't going to make us better dentists. We still have to do our part to a very high level so that the computer can just kind of help us with the, um, you know, taking our records and making them into some final restoration or guide. But we have to make sure what we're putting into the computer is of high quality. So with that, I just wanted to just, you know, kind of quickly go over a summary of, you know, the idea of, oops, sorry, that went through a little quick. Um, you know, idea of the key is getting that comb beam CT scan as a DICOM. When you digitize the patient's teeth, we want that to be in the form of an STL file. Um, I suggest choosing one program for your planning so that you really can master that one program uh, and use that, um, you know, 3D printing in your, in, a guide is a great way to do that. You can do that in your office or you can always send it to laboratories that will do that for you because um, it is a little bit of a messy process. Um, and really the nice thing is to just utilize these guides to help implant placement get more kind of more prosthetically planned and um, really it comes down to just whether you use a guide all the time or just in certain situations, I think you, you everyone will find where they like to use them. I don't use them for every case but I do use them a lot of times when I have multiple teeth that are missing where the difficulty is getting those implants spaced mesial distally where I want them. So it's something that um, can really benefit you. And of course, at the end of the day, the key is it's benefiting your patient. So I hope with that, it was a good re quick review for everyone and um, I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Hello. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really, um, that was uh, Super, super, super information. I mean, just, just the fact that I'm in residency and um, just looking at what you just did, there are some things that, um, you know, knowledge gaps, I mean, you filled it in real good. Uh, I, I just want to make a little request, you know, for residents and people in graduate school, uh, we want, I, I, I will ask if you have some time later on in the year, uh, anytime you have, just to go a little deeper. Because yeah. I know some, and, and a little slow I with, with the process. Because I know something. These are things we do every day, so it's easy. And each person has. And thankfully, you have. You are using the DTX. That's what we have. So <laughs> <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I was wondering. I'm like, okay, what system is it going to use? And that's really. I mean, the, what you showed. I mean, uh, is, is something we do on a daily basis. And the tricks. I mean, when you mentioned just scatter, I'm like, oh man, yeah. That's <laughs> as simple as putting some some cotton rolls there would have saved me because we're like, <laughs> yeah. here. you really can't merge those files if, you know, the scatter is all over the place. Sure. Well, and I'm happy to do more detail. It's just trying to keep it within an hour and not uh, go too yes, long. Yes. It's hard to cover also, it all. the residents, so. we will take two hours from you. I mean, <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's the fun part. <laughs> so we have, uh, we have folks from the uh, University of Michigan and, and folks, there's somebody from, from, from Egypt right here. Awesome. There's people from Ethiopia, Saudi Arabia, uh, nice. uh, and Nepal. I mean, I, I really don't know how many people are on there from different countries, but they are, we are there. Uh, Dr. Oates, uh, Bob, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, please go ahead. Bob is a resident uh, at the University of Michigan. He has awesome. a question for you. Awesome. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Goodacre. That was oh, great. I had a quick been. question. In instances where you have to place the implant more lingual yep. than you would like to, obviously, for the restorative aspect, do you have any experience in planning if you were to cut that tooth in half and then basically make a custom peak healing abutment. Sure. Yeah. And that's the other part in the software when you set it up, for example, in three shape, like the, I was showing a little bit, you have the option to design that where it actually could just be used as a custom healing abutment. So, um, you know, you could go the full route of, let's say, 
have it be the full contour and then you mill it and then you cut it back. That would be up to you. Um, but yes, you can definitely, definitely do that um, if you want to. The only tricky part with, um, you know, is just making sure that within the software you have all the different files that let you mill out, you know, so for example, you would have to mill that off of, you know, mill that and then cement it onto a tie base because, you know, that's the only thing your limitation is, is you couldn't do a complete peak custom made one unless you have access to how the connection is designed, which most of the companies don't give you that. So you would have to have a tie base and then have your custom peak abutment that you would put on top of the tie base. Thank you. Does that, does that make sense? Yep. Okay. I was just wondering about developing a merchant's profile at day of placement. Yeah. And that's, that's an excellent way to do it because that's really the tricky part. And what kind of determines you from everybody else is, you know, most people will just put a healing abutment there. And then all of a sudden, you know, how many teeth do you know that are a perfect circle? I don't know any of them <laughs> that are a perfect circle. So you're always having to modify that after the fact. So um, that's a great way to do it. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, someone just asked, uh, what, what are the failure rates uh, uh, between um, guided versus non-guided cases? Yeah. So again, they've, when they've done the test, really, there's not anything, again, the study I showed you at the end, what it's comparing in there when it has that you saw one of the percentages was like 30 something percent. Well, what they're doing is they're also bringing in prosthetic <laughs> failures into that um, equation. So the implant failure you could see was about 2.7 based on that systematic review, which again is very comparable to freehanded. So really it's not something that you're going to see a difference between if you do freehanded versus guided. Like unless there, you have to remember, there's always a learning curve. So you have to keep in mind if it's your first surgery, you know, that could be some factors that could play into that. But they've shown that implant survi um, you know, survival is not any different between the two. Okay, nice. Now we do have uh, Dr. Pandya, Pandya from India. Uh, Dr. Pandya, can you? Dr. Deval? Okay. I don't know if you can hear me, uh, but I'm going to read out the question. I want sure. you to read out yourself. You said, how do we ensure a good fit of the guy in spite of the dual scan protocol? Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So for a dual scan where you're, you're doing it for a denture, you know, I, what I always do is I will still always evaluate the fit in the patient's mouth. So when I take this, when I have the surgical guide printed, which I didn't go into too much of the completely edentulous surgical guides that we do, but if you're doing the dual scan using the patient's existing denture, I'll, I will still use PIP, um, the pressure indicating paste on the guide, seat that in the patient's mouth and make sure that it's seated properly. Um, again, with tissue supported guides like that, you're going to always have a little more variation in the fit because you remember this, this surgical guide is fitting on soft tissue that's movable. So you have to remember that that's, that's one of the limitations with a soft tissue supported guide guide can give you a little more, let's say, inaccuracies than you would have with a two-supported guide that's really secured on the patient's existing teeth. But again, I use pressure indicating paste, make sure that fits really well. And I do that before I even start the surgery to make sure that it fits accurately. All right. I'm going to check for more. Okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pandya says she's not able to talk. That's fine. Okay. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. I really, if you do have more questions, please, you send it through email. I'm sure Dr. Uh, Goodacre will be kind enough to send the answers in, in, his, in, his, in his spare time. Uh, on the 4th of, uh, next Sunday, uh, the 4th of October, we are blessed. I, I call it a blessing <laughs> to be able to have you talk about digital dentures. This is where the world is going. And um, I know you have, you've done a lot of research and work on that matter. And uh, you, you've been kind enough to, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, come back on, on this series to talk about digital. So let's uh, make it a date. Let your friends know. Send it to all your students across in, in Cairo, in, in Ethiopia, Senegal. Let's come back. And on the 10th, we're going to have uh, Dr. Srivastava, who will be speaking on the... Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 